Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay from Sony Alpha Lab. And what I got in this video, I'm gonna go over the Sony A7R IV Beginner's Guide. So this video is basically for people that have never shot on an advanced camera like this. I'm gonna go over this camera from a beginner-oriented perspective, and I'm gonna break it all down for you to try to help you get going along so you can get out there and take some great pictures and video of whatever you want, whether it's landscapes, street photography, your children, sporting events. It's gonna be a pretty lengthy video. I will put below the video navigation links to different areas of this tutorial. So if you wanna just go quickly to find some one specific thing, for example, how this story starts is you get the A7R 4 it delivers to your house, and you open up the box, and what's inside is all this stuff. So you basically have a USB cable here. It's a USB-C style cable on one side, a regular USB on the other. And you also get this, which is a cable like protector that attaches to the side of the camera. I'll show you that in a minute. You of course get the unbelievably awesome Sony A7R 4 which you see here. Then you get a nice battery charger. This is like the real deal battery charger, so you don't have to charge it in the camera. You can charge it in the camera as well though using the USB-C cable, but it's much better to charge it in this sucker outside the camera, so especially if you have multiple batteries. So here's the battery. It's a Z-series battery, and the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to plug this Z-series battery into the charger like so, and then you're gonna to wanna to plug this in the wall and charge the battery. These lights will light up to let you know they'll all turn green when the battery is fully charged. At that point, you could then take the battery out, put it in the camera, and start following along with this tutorial. So let me move this to the side. You also have a really nice neck, neck strap that's leather, and it says A7R4 there, so in case you wanna wear it around your neck, and just tell everybody in the world that you're using an A7R4. So that's what that is. I actually prefer the wrist strap style, and I have a wrist strap here that I use. So I just took this off for this tutorial so because it kind of gets in the way when I'm going around the camera. But I actually prefer the wrist style for most use. All right, so let me just show off this camera body a little bit. So what you have here is a full frame mirrorless camera. The build quality is very good. It's got a magnesium alloy body, and it's really well made. It's pretty beefy. It feels pretty rugged. So on the front here, what you have is a body cap cover. And what this cap is covering is the full frame sensor. So if you look in there, you can see the full frame sensor, it's quite large. Now, you have the lens contacts down there, that's what these little things are, so when you mount the lens, they will contact that, and that's how the camera communicates with the lens. You also have this white dot here, which is the mount indicator. So when you put a lens on there, you just line up the lens, which will also have a dot on it with this white dot. And then you like basically turn the lens. I'll show you that in a minute to mount it. And then over here, you have a button right there that will release the lens and it has a locking pin right there. So I will show you that in a second. I just want to go over the camera body a little more. Then when you put this lens cap on, there's a little notch there that notch lines up with that white dot, as you can see. Now, you also have an AF illuminator here and self-timer light. So that right there will light up if you're taking a picture of yourself and it'll blink for self-timer. Also in low light conditions, that light will project outward and it'll help the camera focus by, you know, basically sending out a flashlight type beam. Then you have a dial here on the front. Looking at it from the top here, you have the on-off toggle. So you just toggle this switch on and off. I'll show you that in more detail in a second. And then you have the shutter button. Up here you have a locking mode dial. So you have to press this little button down on the mode dial and then you can turn it like so. Then you have custom button two, custom button one. You have an exposure comp dial, which also has a lock button. And then you have another dial here, which you can use to control your aperture or shutter speed. Same thing with the one on the front. You can use that to control your aperture or shutter speed, depending on how you want to customize your settings. Then on the back, you have another dial right here. So you can turn this dial and you can also push the dial. It's got a four way button pad and you can see on the right is ISO. On the left, you have your self timer and other shooting modes. And then you have your display button on the top, which will change what the screen displays. Function button, you have a thumb navigation button here, which and it like moves around. 
so you can control where your focus points are and stuff like that, which is very helpful. You have an auto exposure lock button, so you can actually lock the exposure and then reframe your scene if you want, like if you have a really bright sky or something, that's what the AEL button does. Then you have AF on. By default, this will just basically back button focus for you. You have the record button here for video. Then of course you have your menu button here and you have another custom button here, C3. Also on the top, what you have here is the hot shoe. This little cover comes off like so, and then you could mount hot shoe accessories, such as flash units, audio recording devices, and so forth. Then over here, you have this little weird symbol. That symbol is your sensor measurement point. So if you were to be doing macro photography and you needed to measure exactly sensor distance for focus purposes, you would measure from that line. Then on the left side here, you have a microphone input for your stereo microphone. The other one is on the other side right there. So you don't wanna block those with your fingers. And then of course, you have the articulating screen, which goes you know downward like so. And it also goes up to about there, which is nice if you're getting low to the ground, for example, or you're shooting above, a little above your head. And then you have the garbage can if you want to delete photos. And that can also be turned into a custom button. That's why it says C4 there. And then you have the playback button, which will bring you into playback mode where your photos and videos are stored. And then, of course, in the center here, you also have a button in the center of this ring. So moving on, let me just go over the bottom quick. So on the bottom here, you have the tripod mount, and that's where you would mount a tripod plate, for example, and then it would just pop into the top of your tripod. So that's a quarter inch thread. Then over here, you have your battery door. I might as well put the battery in while I'm here. And it's kind of hot in this room here that I'm filming, so I'm kind of sweating a little bit. I apologize about that, but the air conditioner makes so much noise, I don't want to have it on, but if you notice, um, that's why I'm a little bit sweaty, just because it's so hot in here. So anyways, you put the battery in there, and it's keyed, so it could only go one way. When you close this door, it does not lock automatically, which is really unfortunate. I've been complaining about this since the first Sony camera I've gotten, mirrorless-wise. The DSLR did have an auto lock, the A99 II, but for some reason the mirrorless ones don't. So anyways, you just gotta slide that to the right, and that'll lock that door. Now, on the grip side here you have a really nice grip i mean this grip feels awesome in the hands i absolutely love this grip on the a7r4 but what they have on the side is a the whole grip the back of the grip here opens up if you push on it like that and in there is where the memory cards go you have two uhs2 compatible memory card slots and it takes sd cards like this one so this is the card that i'm currently using and this card's good enough for recording 4k video and stuff and uh, it works pretty darn good. I'm happy with it. They're very affordable. And you can put it in here like so. It goes with the label facing towards the lens or the front. And then you could have another card here in the bottom. It's got dual slots. So you can have one set to RAW, one set to JPEG as a backup, for example, which is great for redundancy purposes if you're doing, you know, high profile customer shoots, for example, things like that. And down here, it's hard to see right now, but there's a little light. There's a little LED there that lights up when the camera is writing to the memory card. Now over here on the left side is where you have all your different ports and stuff. So you have a flash sync port up there, which is kind of old school these days, but it's, it's still nice to have if you are using that type of studio setup. Now up here, and these doors are kind of rubberized too, by the way, they're like rubbery, and it's much better than the original design that Sony had. They definitely improved it with these rubberized doors. So you have your microphone input up top. That's the red one. You have a headphone input here. That's the black one. Then you have the micro HDMI port here, which you can use to hook your camera up to a television. If you want to watch yourself while you're recording, you can also use that to hook up to an external monitor or an external recording device for even better quality because you can output better quality out of the HDMI if you choose to work that way. A lot of professionals do that. And also you can just hook it up to a TV to play the videos and stuff to show your friends and family if you're on vacation or something. You just get a micro HDMI cable to regular HDMI. And I will have that linked below the video if you wanna pick one up. They're cheap enough, that's no big deal. But they're nice to have. I actually use one all the time when I'm recording in front of the camera. I have a 
micro HDMI hooked up and I have it going to a TV that I use as a monitor. Now down here, you have the USB-C port that you can charge from and you also have a micro USB cable that you can use to charge from or get the photos off the camera if you want. So you can use these things to extract the files off the memory card and or to charge the camera. So you can use these to power the camera while you're recording video or taking photos as well. So if you're in a studio environment and you're worried about your batteries dying, you can always have the camera plugged in while you're using it and it'll power the camera so you won't have to worry about the battery dying and stuff. And then uh, in addition here, you have the OLED viewfinder. It's a very high quality viewfinder. It looks awesome when you look through here. When you put your eye up to the viewfinder, the screen will automatically turn off. And it's got a little sensor up there that will trip and cause the OLED to turn on and the screen to turn off. This screen is also a touch screen, but the touch screen function is turned off by default. So I'm gonna show you how to turn that on because it's an awesome feature. However, if you're new to using cameras and stuff, and you're new to the touch focus technology and, th and stuff like that, you may want to have that turned off and you might rather use the joystick to move the focus around, for example, because you can accidentally touch the screen, which will cause the focus point to go to where you just touched. And that does kind of suck sometimes, uh, especially if you're not aware that that can happen. I'll show you that in a minute when I turn the camera on. So the other thing I wanna show you is how to mount a lens. So let's just turn this back around and I'm gonna take the lens or the body cap off and I'm gonna bring the lens I have here. What I got is the Sony FE 24 to 105 millimeter F4 OSS lens. And I'm gonna mount that up. So what you do is you take that white dot, see the white dot on the lens? You put marry that up to the white dot on the camera body like so and you just turn it and it clicks. You hear that click? Now to take the lens off, remember that button I told you about down here? You just press that button and then that will release the lock and you can take the lens off like so. Otherwise the lens is locked on. You can't just take, you can't just screw it on and off. You have to hit that release button there to release the lock. So I'm just gonna take the lens cap off here. Now this is a zoom lens. So if you turn this ring here, the lens will zoom from 24 millimeter all the way to 105 millimeter. So that's a zoom lens. Prime lenses have no zoom and they just have a focus ring. This is the focus ring. And you can focus with that if you wanna use manual focus, for example. And then also on the side of the lens, you'll have some features like autofocus, manual focus. You can also turn that on and off in the camera. And then you have optical steady shot. You could turn that on and off on the lens if you want just so you know. And then this button here is a focus hold button by default, but you can custom program that to a couple different things. And that's basically how that works. So also, I just wanted to show you quickly how this cable protector mounts. Basically what it does is it just slips on here like so. It fits right there on the bottom. And then this little spring here is actually a screw. So if you just push that in and turn it, it will thread into a thread that the camera body has, and then that will now hold the cables in place. So you would basically plug a cable in, you know, to a given port, and then you would unscrew this, that little guy, and then you would basically, the cable will come out, it'll go down, and you can route it up through this slot, like so. Let me just show you that real quick. All right, so for example, if I was gonna plug in this USB-C cable to charge the camera while I'm using it, I would plug the, the cable in, and now what I would do is I could then route the cable through this little notch here and then put this cap on. Like so. And that'll basically pinch the cable like that. So now if the cable gets tugged, it's never gonna pull on the actual port itself. You see how it's locked in there? And you could weave this the other way. You can go down and then up through this little lock, you know, wh whatever works for you. Um, I just wanted to illustrate that to you quick because it will save your ports and it's very easy to accidentally tug on a cable, especially if you're using the HDMI cable and stuff like that. So this is included with the A7R4 and that's a really cool feature that it comes with that. It's a very innovative accessory. Let's take that off for now. All right, guys, so now I'm gonna show you 
what it looks like when you turn this camera on. So like I said before earlier, there's this toggle here, and when you turn that on, the camera will turn on. And this is what you will be greeted with when you first turn it on. So I'm English speaking, so I'm gonna select English. All right, so basically what you gotta do is you gotta enter the date and time. That's the first thing you gotta do. I live in New York, so I'm gonna select that. Daylight savings time, I'll turn that on. Date and time is not set. So right now at the time of this recording, it is Friday, July 17th. So I'm gonna set that quick. 2020. And the time is 621. And I'm just going to click enter. And now it's telling you about the imaging edge software, which you can get to control the camera from your smart device. And you can also use it to basically share photos from the camera to your smart device while you're in the field. And it's pretty convenient. Um, although a little bit finicky of an app for sure, but I have a few different tutorials on how to use this. Be sure to check those out. I will link them below or just, you know, search my how-to videos on my channel and you will find the how to use the Imaging Edge software. And then I'm just going to click OK. And right now you're looking at what the camera sees. So basically all you have to do, let me just zoom out a little bit. So if you hit the shutter button, by default, the camera is gonna focus on what it sees in front of the camera. And by default, it is going to prioritize faces. So I'm just pressing this button halfway down. If I wanna take a picture, you press it all the way and it'll take the photo. So if you just press it halfway, it will focus. And then notice you can also focus by hitting this button here, AF on, which is back button focus by default. And that works really well. So you can do it either way, but to take the picture, you have to put the shutter button down. All right, so I am in full auto mode, as you can see here. So if you've never used a camera before, don't be afraid, don't be embarrassed. Just put the camera in full auto and you pretty much just point and shoot and use the lens zoom to, you know, control your range and what you're looking at and stuff. And you will get great pictures most of the time. So that is what full auto does. Now there's all other modes on here. You got much more powerful modes, which I will go over in another video, but basically full auto will get you up and running and it's a very powerful mode, even though you might say, you know, I didn't buy this camera to use full auto, you know, I, I want to, you know, I could manual mode only, <laughs> you know, all the stuff people say, just ignore those people. If you don't know how to use a camera, just start using the full auto, take some pictures. You will be go out and about, walk around, shoot some shots and you will be amazed at how amazing the image quality is on this camera. But I will go over more advanced features, um, like I said, in another video. I'm, I'm gonna cover video in this video quickly and P mode, but the more advanced modes like aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual mode, I'm gonna save that for another video. Um, same thing with S and Q. All right, so when you're in full auto mode, up here on the top left is basically the scene recognition that the camera is seeing. So right now it sees that human face and it thinks it's a small child, so it looks like a baby. So it's basically putting it in like a portrait mode. But if I zoom in a little bit and get rid of that face, it's gonna zoom on what's closest to the camera. So right now it's zooming in on my Nex6 with Minolta lens on there. And you can see just how awesome the depth of field is and stuff with a lens and a camera like this, full frame camera and lens. And the depth of field is basically just the area of sharpness. So notice how the lens cap is very sharp, but in the background it's blurring out. That's like the depth of field. That's what that means. And when I zoom in, notice it's it says it as a macro shot now because I'm so close to the Nex6 Minolta lens that it, it's sensing it as a macro and it's intelligent scene recognition is just putting the camera in macro mode and optimizing it for that. And that's what's great about full auto mode. It'll automatically recognize the scene. So if you're outside taking landscape pictures, it'll look like a picture of a mountain and it'll optimize the camera to do the best job in that scenario. Also, the in when you're in auto mode, you have very limited amount of options here. So right now it's telling you here on the bottom left, AF on, and it's showing you a little picture of a human. That's telling you that facial recognition priority is turned on. That's why when I zoomed out, if it sees a face, 
Notice here how it's automatically focusing on the face. You can see that little green box popping up. If there's a face in the scene, the camera is gonna prioritize that face by default. You can turn that off, but it's important to know because if you wanna take a picture of that camera, the next six, for example, and that face is in the scene, it will not do it. So you can now override that if you want by using touch to focus and just focusing on the lens cap, but touch to focus is off by default. You can also override that by changing your focus mode, but you can't change your focus mode when you're in full auto. It defaults to wide area. So what I'm gonna do is, over here there's a button that says FN. That stands for the function button. I'm gonna click that button to show you the different features you have when you're in full auto mode. So this one here on the left is drive mode. So if you click the center button here on this turn wheel, that will, that's like the enter button basically, and that'll bring you deeper into the menus. So drive mode, you have single shooting, which means when you focus and take a picture, it's just gonna take one picture. That's single shooting. Now if you go back in there and you change it to continuous shooting, you, can, you have a bunch of different options. Notice how there's little arrows, left and right arrows, next to the continuous shooting function there. You got low, high, high plus, medium, that's high plus, medium. So if I put it on medium, for example, and take a picture, see how it's rapid firing? So that rapid fire option is great if you're taking pictures of kids, sports, things like that, moving subjects, because it's, you know, you're, the chances of getting a sharper shot are gonna be better if you're taking multiple photos. So that's what that option does. Now, if you go back in here, you could scroll down one more, you have self timer. Self timer is great if you want the camera to have no shake and it's on top of a tripod. You wanna get the absolute sharpest shot possible. You can set the self timer for like five seconds or two seconds by using the left and right on this dial. Again, notice the arrows next to the self timer. So if I have it set for two seconds, for example, that's good. See how it just counted the two seconds and it beeped to let you know, and then it took the photo. That's what self timer does and that's how you get to that. Then you have self timer continuous. It's basically the same thing as self timer, except it'll take three shots consecutively after the time limit is up. So that's a good feature if you're taking a family portrait, for example, somebody always has their eyes closed. So if you take three shots, the chances of getting one of them with everybody's eyes open, for example, will be higher if you do self-timer continuous. And that's just a good way to go for that purpose. I'm just gonna go back to single shooting mode, and then I'm gonna hit the function menu again to show you the next option, focus mode. Now, right now it's set to AFA, which stands for autofocus automatic. And what that means is it'll automatically switch between continuous autofocus and autofocus single shot. What single shot means is it'll focus and then it won't like move. It locks and it stays there. If you move the camera, the focus will not move. If you set the camera to autofocus continuous and then you focus, it's gonna continuously focus. So if you move the camera around, notice how those focus dots are moving because it's continuously focusing when I have the shutter button halfway pressed or if I have this autofocus button halfway pressed. It's gonna continuously focus. And that's, again, you wanna use continuous autofocus for moving subjects in particular. So if you're taking pictures of somebody running, sports, things like that, you're gonna to wanna to have it on continuous focus. Now what autofocus automatic does is it'll automatically sense if there's a moving subject and it'll switch it to AFC for you automatically. So if you're new to the camera and new to cameras in general, I would just leave it on autofocus automatic for now. It does a great job most of the time. Now direct manual focus is a great feature because basically what that does is it'll focus for you like automatically, but then if you turn the focus ring, you can fine tune it after the fact. And this is great for taking macro shots, shots of flowers and things like that, when the camera just won't focus on what you want exactly, but it gets it pretty close. You can just do direct manual focus like that, focus, and then turn the dial to fine tune it. And then once you get it where you want it, you press the shutter all the way and it'll take the shot. That's what DMF stands for. And then of course you have manual focus. That's just full manual focus. You have to turn the focus ring in order to adjust it and there's, that's really all you can do with that mode. So I'm just gonna go back to AFA and hit the function menu again. And then here you have the flash mode. Now there's no built-in flash, so if you had a flash on the hot shoe here, 
that would be how you control that. There's different flash modes out there. And then over here, you have prioritize record media. If you go in there, it's basically what slot are you using, slot one, slot two, and you can change those settings there. Now, if you go back up to the mode dial and you change the mode to P mode, like so, notice how now I have way more options on the sides and stuff. I got metering modes, white balance, all sorts of stuff like that. So now if I go back into the function menu, look at how the, all these different features I have now. Now I can change the metering mode, I can change the ISO, I can change the focus area, the white balance, the creative mode. So let's go over a couple of those settings quick. Focus area is one of the most important features because you can change where and you know where on the sensor the camera is focusing. Wide area will use the entire sensor and it will focus by default on what is closest to the camera unless there's a face in the scene. Or you can also turn off facial priority and then it will ignore the faces and just focus on what's closest to the camera. But by default, it'll focus on a face if it sees it or what's closest to the camera. Now you can limit where it focuses by using different focus areas. So you have zone focus here. All right, so notice when I have zone selected, if you use the joystick here, you can move where that box is. So you can prioritize the focus to any of these locations and it'll only focus on what's within that area. So now look, if I focus now, it's gonna focus on the Minolta. Even though the face is in the scene, it is not focusing on the face because the focus area is limited to that zone. So if I go back to function, you can change the focus area. Now you have center. So center focus will just give you that little square and it'll only focus on what's in the center of the scene and by default what's closest to the camera. If I go back, you now have flexible spot and you can notice there's little arrows. You can change the size of the flexible spot from large to small and medium. So I'm just gonna select medium and now I could move I'm going to select medium, and now if you use this joystick, you could move where that goes, move it all around. And again, when you have touch to focus enabled, you can simply just touch on the screen and not have to do any of this. If you, you have touch to focus enabled, it'll automatically switch it to a small spot like that, and you can just touch the screen wherever you want. But if you're not using touch to focus, you can do it this way. And this is a very powerful feature. Notice that, now it's focusing on the face because I have it over there. If I move it over here, it's gonna focus on the background, the gimbal back there. And then I could move it back to the Minolta and now it's focusing on that. So if I go back to the function menu and go back to focus area, you have flexible expandable spot, very similar to the previous mode, except it's a smaller point and the AF area will, will basically expand out from that small square a little bit. And this is good for really small fast moving subjects, for example, like if you're trying to track a bird or a running dog or something like that, you would use a mode like this and you would probably get more a better result depending on you know what you're shooting and things like that and based on your skill level as well. But it's just nice to know that there's these different focus areas in there if you are not aware. So I'm just gonna put it back to wide mode, go back into the function menu and show you a few more things. So over here you have your ISO, that is just the sensor sensitivity. It's currently set to auto, but if you go in here, you can go to the right by hitting the right on the uh, circle dial here, and then you could set your auto, your ISO auto minimum and maximum, and you can raise the maximum up or lower it if you want, whatever you wanna do. You could raise it up to like 25,000. You can put the ISO minimum, the lowest you can go is 100 for auto. So that's how you do that. Or you can just go down and hard set your ISO if you want. And that's what ISO does. And then over here is your metering mode. Metering is basically how the camera decides to expose your image. And based on what metering mode you're using is how the camera will prioritize the exposure. So if I change it to center weight, notice how the image got brighter. You see that? So when I have it on center, it's only using the center area and it's ignoring the really bright light that's on the top right. And that's why the scene got brighter. If I raise it up, now it's using the entire sensor area and it dimmed it a little bit so the light on the top right didn't blow out. Then you have 
spot metering. Now spot metering is just using the absolute very center of the image. It's a small little spot in the center and it works pretty good for certain subjects if you're having a hard time exposing properly. And uh, it's just another tool for the, uh, you know, having your tool bag. Then entire screen average is very similar to uh, multi-mode. Highlight priority will prioritize the highlights. Now this is a great feature for scenes where there's something really bright and you want to make sure the camera doesn't overexpose. What comes to mind is a wedding dress, for example, in the sun. You don't want that wedding dress to like blow out because it'll ruin the image. You can go into highlight metering mode as an example and it'll make sure that that dress doesn't blow out. Another scene would be like water where there's like frothy like white water or something like that, you know where the rapids are and you don't want that to blow out. You can set your metering to highlight mode and it'll make sure that those highlights don't blow. So that's a really cool metering mode feature. But in general, I tend to use multi-metering mode and I will use other tools like the exposure comp dial or I will go into manual mode and I will manipulate my shutter speed and aperture and ISO to dial in the exposure exactly how I want it. But that's a more advanced way of using the camera, which hopefully, you know, you put the time and the effort in and you will work up to that level. It's not that bad, but it does take some practice and trial and error. And then over here, you got white balance. White balance is how the camera decides to render the colors based on the white balance. You know, white is always supposed to be white. So if you're shooting in a cold light environment, it'll be more blue. The light will be more bluish looking and the camera will accommodate for that. Um, same thing with warm conditions. That'll be more yellowy, so the, the camera will compensate for that. And auto white balance works pretty darn good, but you're better off hard setting this value based on the conditions you're in for a more consistent result. And um, you have incandescent lights, um, all sorts of options in here. If you scroll down underwater, Kelvin will allow you to dial in your color temperature, which is great for studio environments in particular. The lights I'm using right now are 3200K, so I could just simply hit the right arrow. Notice how there's an arrow there. You can go to the right, and I could just dial this down to 32, and that is the correct white balance for the lighting that I'm currently using. So now I'm technically using not auto white balance. I'm using like the hard set here, 3200. See that? And I'll just leave it there. That's fine. Now creative style is basically how the camera processes your files. You have a bunch of different options, and this works for both JPEGs and RAW files. Standard will basically render your scene very realistic looking for the most part. Um, you can also hit the arrow here and go to the right, and you can manipulate these settings. So you can make the contrast, you can add contrast, like, you know, take out contrast, add saturation, and sharpness. So you can manipulate these settings as well to your liking if you want the camera to do processing for you. Vivid will obviously jack up the saturation and stuff like that. Neutral will actually desaturate a little bit and make it a little bit more neutral. Clear is just another option. You know, it gives you like a certain look. Deep will give you a different look. You can see how the image is slightly changing when I scroll through these. And then you got portrait, landscapes, which will prioritize, you know, certain colors and stuff like that. All right, so like I was saying, P mode on the top here is basically like full auto mode, but it gives you a little bit more power um, like I just showed you. So let me go into the menu system now. Actually, before I do that, let me show you what the uh, this button here does, this display button. If I hit the display button, which is the top of the wheel on the back here, you just push it in. If you hit that, notice how the information on the screen is changing. So this is showing a histogram which is used for exposure. Now you have the leveler. So if you tilt the camera, it'll show you if it's level or not. That's what that thing does. It's a really cool feature. And then you have this mode, which will basically show you all the current information and configuration of the camera. Now, if you turn this dial on the top, notice how it's changing the aperture. So the aperture is now changing F8, F11, and so forth. And the aperture is basically the eye of the lens and that eye can get like larger and smaller, just like the pupil in a human eye. I'll show you that. You can manipulate that by turning this dial in P mode. And then on the front of the camera, you can change the aperture and or shutter speed as well. So the exposure is staying the same, 
but you can change the settings by turning these dials depending on what kind of depth of field you want. And remember, the depth of field is the area of sharpness, you know, the, the, the sliver of sharpness. So the narrow depth of field, they'll only be a little bit in focus. A large depth of, depth of field, they'll be a lot more in focus. So for portraits, you would want, you know, the camera at like f4, for example, if you want the background to be blurry. But for landscapes, you would want the f-stop at a higher value, like f8, f11, or something like that. So everything is sharp from, you know, the front to the back of the scene. If you want everything in the scene sharp, that's what the uh, aperture controls. And you can control that in P mode. And like I said, it's just a little more advanced auto mode. So if you're comfortable in auto and you're ready to move on to the next level, switch it up to P mode, and then you can turn some of these dials, start playing with your aperture and shutter speed a little bit, and that will, you know, get you geared up and ready to go for the more advanced modes, which I will cover in another video. So let me go into the menu here and show you how incredibly vast and complicated this menu system is. It's got a lot of features in here and I'm going to go over a bunch of them, but I'm not going to go into crazy detail because remember, this is a beginner oriented video. First off, you have these tabs on the top, which are your different menu categories, basically. And then within these menu categories over here, you have the page number. So notice how it says one of 15. So you can scroll over. Now, if you go up to the top, you can switch between these cat, these tabs, these different settings. So you have network, movie, quality, image size, playback, setup, and then you have my menu. My menu is an awesome area. This is where you can put the settings that you use most. You can just load up my menu and you can create pages of settings that you use most so you can find them easily and quickly. Because as you just saw, 15 pages worth of crap is hard to navigate and it's near impossible to remember where the given setting is unless you just use it all the time. So even I can't find stuff in here and I've been using these cameras for years. It's just that complicated. But anyways, let me just go over a couple of key settings here. So file format is basically whether you're shooting in JPEG or raw quality. Now JPEG is basically a file that is easily shareable on the internet. You can just email that file to your friends. You can just upload it to Facebook, for example and it's very easy to use. The camera does all the processing for you. So it'll add sharpening, it'll add saturation, it'll fix noise if there's noise in the image, if you're using a high ISO value. For example, you can change the quality of the JPEG from fine to extra fine. Extra fine is the best quality, I would recommend using that. You can also change the size of the JPEG. So 60 megapixel is the best quality. You can change it to 26 or 15 megapixel if you want. Like if you do not need the ultra high resolution, you're on vacation or something, or whatever the case may be, you're, you're at an event and you need to take a lot of pictures, but they don't have to be 60 megapixel. You can lower the quality to like medium or something, and then you'll be able to fit way more images on your memory card. And, uh, you know, 60 megapixel is gigantic. So remember, you're going to fill up your hard drive on your computer really quick with images of that size. Now, raw quality, if you go back up here to file format, you can also shoot raw plus JPEG. And raw quality, which is what I shoot, basically means the image comes out raw. So there's no sharpening applied. I mean, there are there is minimal processing done by the camera, but there's much more information in a raw file and it's not compressed as much. So you can manipulate it and enhance it much more in post-processing in a program like Lightroom, for example. You can take a raw file and you can edit that raw file like way further than you can a JPEG file. A JPEG file, if you push the colors and the contrast too far, you'll start to get color banding and things like that. With a raw file, you don't get that. You can push it way further and ultimately you can get a better quality image than what the camera can produce in JPEG mode if you practice processing images. It takes a little bit of time, but it's not that hard. And I have a couple of videos that will show you how to process raw files if you're interested in doing that. Now, you can also save uncompressed raw. Now, these files are gigantic in size, but they're uncompressed. So you're, that's gonna be your best possible quality if you wanna do post-processing, but the image sizes are pretty darn large. I actually tend to use compressed for the most part, which, you know, you might think is stupid because if you want the best quality possible, you got to use uncompressed. 
But at the end of the day, the compressed ones are, are more than good enough pretty much for anything that I'm doing. These days, if I was taking a professional landscape scene for a customer and I planned on going into Photoshop and doing some seriously hardcore editing, I would use uncompressed. But for the most part, I tend to just use compressed to simply just to save file size. Now, if you scroll down further, you have aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is basically the shape that the image is gonna end up in. So you have these three by two, which is like more, it's like a rectangle, a four by six, you know, rectangle. Um, four by three is kind of like an eight by 10, you know, shape, for, you know, sort of. It's more of a square, but not quite a square. 16 by nine is like a cinema format. So it's that really wide and skinny, you know, view. And then you have one to one, which is a square. So you can change that in here if you prefer to shoot in a different aspect ratio. That's what that does. Now down here, you have Super 35 APS-C. So what that means is, if you put a different lens on, because this is an E-mount camera, you can mount all sorts of lenses to this. So they have full frame lenses, and then they have crop factor camera lenses. And crop factor cameras are like the smaller mirrorless cameras, like the Sony a6600, for example, the a6400. Those cameras have a smaller sensor, and that smaller sensor size is known as the APS-C sensor size. So if you put one of those lenses on the camera, it'll automatically switch to that mode if you have this set to auto. That's what that means, just so you're aware. I know this is a lot of information, so I'm gonna start skimming through here a little quicker, but there was a couple of key settings there that I wanted to show you. Now, interval shooting function, that is your time lapse. And basically what that does is you can set the camera up to take a certain amount of shots for a certain amount of time in a certain interval. So like every five seconds, every 10 seconds or whatever. And then it basically will just take a series of shots for however long you want. And then you can take those images and put them together to create a time-lapse video. And that's what you use interval shooting function for. I actually have a dedicated video on that if you're interested on how to use that feature. So just look for that in my how-tos and I will uh, link it below as well. Pixel shift multi-shoot, that's that super advanced feature where the camera will take like 16 photos and then you can combine all those photos if you use the Sony software to get even more detail than you would with just a regular 60 megapixel. I have to create a video using this feature. I have not used it yet at the time of this recording, but that is a really advanced super high quality, potentially producing function. And I really want to uh, get into that at some point. Uh, memory mode, you can basically save camera settings into these different memory slots, and then you can recall them at uh, any time by turning on the mode dial. You have the one, two, and the three there, and that corresponds to the memory modes. So you can basically set the camera up for sports, set the camera up for portraits, and set the camera up for landscapes, for example, and then have the camera set however you want, and then save it to the memory slot, and then you can easily just recall that memory by turning the dial. So if you're trying to take a picture at a sporting event, you can just switch it to like one, for example, if you set that up for sports, and then you won't have to go in and change the autofocus to continuous, to multi-shot mode, and all that stuff. You can just save it to these settings, which is a really cool feature. Now, if I go further to the right, um, this is just in reference to the memory cards and stuff like that. Now, I'm gonna skim through some of these settings because they're a little bit more advanced and it's really not worth going into in this beginner-oriented video. All right, so the face IAF set, if you go in there and just click that, this is where you can turn the face eye priority on and off. So notice I have it set to off right now and the, it's not focusing on that face even though it's in the scene. But if I go back in there and turn it on, and you can see the little icon there. All right, now I have it set to on, and now look. Now see how it's focusing on the face on the, on the left here and not the Minolta lens cap? So that's what you can do with that feature. Again, that might be a problem for you in some scenarios, so occasionally you might have to turn that on or off. Now subject detection, you can set it to human or animal and it'll do a better job if you have it on, you know, dog and cat mode, uh, if you're shooting pictures of your pets, for, for example. 
Now pre-AF will basically the camera will automatically focus even if you're not pressing the shutter button down halfway. That is off by default, but it is a pretty cool feature if you want the camera to automatically focus even if you're not pressing the shutter button. You can turn the pre-autofocus on, but it will, you know, eat up a little bit of battery life just so you're aware. You can change the focus frame color to a different color if uh, you don't want white. This camera is extremely powerful. It's got so many different features in here. So here you got your white balance and your creative style. I actually set the creative style to landscape by accident. Let me put that back to standard. Oh, and by the way, when you're in the menu, if you hit the garbage can button down here at any time, it'll tell you what that feature does in more detail, which is pretty darn awesome. So creative style, that's what that does. You just hit the center button for OK. Picture profile, again, I'm gonna hit the garbage can. You can make your preferred image quality setting by adjusting gamma detail and etc. Picture profile is a more advanced feature, especially for video shooters. So if you wanna get, you know, S-Log3 and cinema grade footage and stuff like that, you would wanna turn your picture profile on and select your given picture profile for whatever you prefer using. This is a more advanced feature. It's similar to shooting raw, kind of, if you're taking photos but more for video, and it'll expand the dynamic range of the video that you're recording, so you can then manipulate the video footage much more in post-processing, kind of similar to a RAW photo versus a JPEG photo. Shutter Auto White Balance Lock is a cool feature because you can use this if you're taking pictures of sports, for example, and you're doing continuous shooting, it'll lock your auto white balance during the continuous shooting burst, and I like to have that feature on. It's very helpful so your auto white balance doesn't change if you're taking, you know, like 30 pictures in a row, like somebody's running towards you, for example. You don't want the auto white balance shifting midway through. You want it to maintain that white balance. So I have that set to continuous shooting. And you got all sorts of other settings in here. All right, so now I'm on to the next tab. Now here is your movie file formats. So if I go into file format, this is where you can select your 4K video. So let me select 4K, and then you have your record setting. So your record setting is basically the format that you're recording in. So what I tend to use most is 24P at 100 megabits per second when I'm recording in 4K. Now, if you want to record slow motion footage, for example, and you want to use 120, you would set it to HD, the SHD mode there. Then if you go into the record setting, you have many more options here. You have 60p, 120p at 100 megabits per second will be the best quality if you want to get some slow motion footage. Basically, you would record at 120p. Then you would bring that footage into a video processing program like Final Cut Pro, for example, which is what I use. And then you can slow down that 120p footage to 24 frames per second and that will then give you like five times slow motion. And that's a really cool feature if you wanna get that really dramatic slow motion effect. It, it works really well. But for the most part, I tend to use 4K when I'm recording at 24P. Now AF drive speed, basically how fast the focus will switch from one subject to another when recording video. That's what that does. Tracking sensitivity will also basically trigger when the focus is gonna switch. I actually have a video on that, video autofocus modes, if you want to learn more about that. And then you have all sorts of other features, marker display, marker settings, and things like that. Movie with shutter, if you don't want to hit the record button, you can have movie record with the shutter. Silent shooting, this is where you turn that on, see that feature? So if you want the camera, if you're like in at a wedding in a church or something, and you don't want the camera to be beeping and stuff like that, you can set it to silent shooting and turn that on, and that'll help you out with that. Now live view display, setting effect on. That will basically just make sure that the viewfinder will, if you change settings, the, the exposure and stuff will automatically adjust. If you have that set off, it won't automatically adjust. And sometimes you might need that in a studio environment if you're using off-camera flashes, for example. You want to turn that off if you're in that environment. But in general, you're going to want to leave that on. That's one of the awesome features of the electronic viewfinder and monitor is that it automatically will show you what your picture is going to look like before you take it. And that's one of the huge advantages of modern cameras today. So you want to leave that on for the most part. Now custom operation, this is where you can control 
what you program your custom keys to. You remember the custom keys, one, two, three, and four? You can change that for photos, you can change them for video, and then you can also change them for playback independently. And the function menu, you can also custom configure. So you can load that function menu with items that you want. And you can also change your dial settings, dial setup. You see by default, you got aperture, and then you have shutter. So it's telling you that the dial on the front is aperture, the dial on the back is shutter, for example. And you can change that up if you prefer in a different way. And you got audio signals, you can turn that off. If you don't want the camera to do that, you can turn that off with audio signals. Now in here you have your network setup. This is where you would go to send images. If you were to use the Image Edge software, for example, you can send them to the smartphone using that function there. And you can also control your camera with the smartphone. This is where you would hit, you would enable that. You basically hit that and then you would, you know, turn the app on on your phone. And when you watch that video tutorial that I created on that, you will see me do that in, in that tutorial. That's where those settings are on the network. You can set the camera to airplane mode if you want, all sorts of stuff like that. Wi Fi settings, location link. So if you want to connect to your smart device to add GPS, file information, you can do that there. Now here in playback mode, just a couple of playback options. You can change if, how your image is enlarged and stuff. Then you got your playback speed for interval shooting. So you can actually preview your time lapse and you can select the speed at which it plays back depending on how you took the time lapse. So that's what that feature is. So you can kind of get a preview of what the time lapse looks like on the camera without having to, you know, put it on the computer first, which is a really nice feature and I actually enjoy using that when I take a time lapse. It's very rewarding to see, you know, how the time lapse came out because it often takes a long time to get a good time lapse, you know. Also in here, you can select a slideshow, like if you have it hooked up to a TV via the HDMI cable, you can select slideshow and the camera will play a nice slideshow for you as you watch it. Now if you go in here to monitor brightness, it's set to manual, but if you actually click the center button, you can change it to sunny weather. And sunny weather will make the LCD screen like really bright, so it's much easier to see in the sun. But it will use some battery as well because it's pumping more power to the monitor. But that's a great feature if you're having a hard time seeing the screen in bright conditions. Switch it, just switch it to sunny weather mode and you'll be good to go. And you could also change the brightness in here if you want. You might want to make it dimmer if you're in a dark environment, for example. Go back to the menu. Now display quality, I have it set to standard, but you can make that high if you want. And that'll make the quality on the screen look a little bit better. So I'm going to change that to high. Power save start time. This is basically how quickly the camera will shut off if you're not using it. And I like to have this set to two minutes because one minute's just not enough. Auto power off temperature. Now this, you're gonna wanna change this to high. Basically what'll happen is if you're recording 4K video for a long time, the camera will get hot and it'll automatically shut off the camera if it gets too hot. So if you have it set to standard, it'll shut off much sooner than if you have it set to high. So make sure you set that to high. And then NTSC slash PAL, this is where you can change your frame rate. So if you're a European country, your format standard is PAL. So that'll be 25 frames per second versus 24 frames per second, which is what NTSC is. And that's where you can change that. Now touch operation, this is where you turn that on. I'm gonna turn that on. And now watch this, I can just touch right there See how that focus box came up? And now it's just focusing there. Now if I touch over on the face, it's gonna focus over there. I can touch on the gimbal in the background. It's gonna focus there. This is why touch to focus is so awesome. Now notice you have the focus cancel, it says there. It's referring to the button in the center of this wheel here. If you hit that, that's gonna cancel the touch to focus. Now the downside to touch to focus is you can accidentally touch the screen. And then you're trying to take a picture and you don't understand necessarily why the camera's not focusing on what you want. You didn't realize that you touched it and touch to focus is actually enabled and it might be like all the way over here on the edge and, and you just don't see it. And you're like, why is the camera focusing over there? So you have to cancel the touch to focus. So you can do that by hitting the center button on the dial or there's a little hand up on the top there with an X. You can just tap that with your finger and that will cancel touch to focus. 
And I highly recommend using this feature. It may mess you up occasionally, but as long as you know that you can cancel it, it's not that big of a deal. But once you get used to it, it is so far superior than changing your autofocus mode area or whatever. You can just touch wherever you want and prioritize the focus that way. So I highly recommend putting that on. Even though, like I said, you might have a, a, some issues with it here and there. Then touch panel pad. When you're using the viewfinder, the screen is like considered a pad at that point. And you can basically change how much of the screen you want to act as the touch focus because you could use your thumb on the screen while you're looking through the viewfinder. The IR remote control, I actually have one of those and I like to turn that on so I can control, you know, take pictures remotely with my remote. So I turn that on. HDMI settings, you may have to change these settings if you're hooking the camera up to a TV and it's not working. You might have to change the frame rate or something, for example, like you might have to change this to 24 or whatever in order to get it to work, depending on what kind of monitor you're hooking it up to. In general, it just tends to work though, from my experience, but that's where those options are if you need them. You got a whole bunch of other stuff here. USB power, notice how that's turned on. And remember I told you you can power the camera by using the USB ports on the side, and that feature you can turn on and off here this is also where you can change your language if you need to. Format, this is where you would format the memory card. You would just click that. And then it's, it's gonna ask you what slot you wanna format, for example. And if you go down here to version, that'll tell you the current software version of the camera body. So I'm at version one. The lens is at version 01. Just click okay. So if you wanna check for firmware updates, make sure your camera is at the latest firmware. And then you have save and load settings. Setting reset, if you want to set the camera back to factory default, you can click initialize. And then my menu here, I'm just going to click add item. And you can add a couple items here. I'm going to add file format, because I use that all the time. Then I am going to go over to the right here, or the left. And I'm going to add format, because I format the memory card all the time. I'm going to add that. So now if I hit menu, and I go back to page one, notice there's two pages for the My Menu. If I go to page one, now I have those two features saved. I got File Format and Format the Memory Card right there. So now I can just easily find that. I don't have to scroll through the menu endlessly to find that. Let me switch it to Movie Mode here. Now when you switch it to Movie Mode, notice how the camera automatically cropped in a little bit by default and the audio levels come up and it's also cropping to show you the format of what you're actually going to record because it doesn't record in the same frame style as when it takes photos. So if I switch it back, notice how it didn't zoom in. So it, it automatically by default crops when you go to video mode. You see that? So now if I go to menu and I go to the right here, turn the super 35 millimeter off. Now notice I'm recording video and it didn't zoom in on me. So now I'm rec recording using the full frame sensor. So you would have to turn that feature in the menu off so it doesn't automatically go to super 35 millimeter mode. Now, a lot of people say the super 35 millimeter mode is better quality. It'll give you sharper images and stuff like that. But if you want the full sensor and you want the full scene, you would need to turn that feature off, just so you know. So I tend to leave it off because I want the full frame view of the world. But again, depending on your project and sharpness, image quality and things like that, you might find Super 35 millimeter works better for you. That's obviously debatable. And there's videos out there that go into detail about that, like hardcore video users will break that down in more detail than I'm gonna do. That's pretty much how it goes. And then you can just hit the record button and it'll start recording video. And there you have it. So you can see it's recording and then you can just touch to focus to change the focus. Notice how it just switched to the Minolta lens there. If I zoom in a little bit. And now watch when I touch on the background. See how it just smoothly transitioned? Look at this. And it's doing that while I'm recording video. Pretty darn awesome. All right, so the last thing I wanted to show you was the playback menu. And if you hit the play button on the bottom of the camera here, that'll bring you into playback. And you could watch, you know, your videos. If you hit the button here, it'll just play your video that you recorded. 
You can actually skip through it and so forth. And then if you just turn this dial, you can scroll through the different photos and stuff that are on your memory card. And I have a lot of pictures on here that I took for test shots and stuff. And then in addition to that, up here you have the hourglass or, you know, the zoom little magnifying glass thing. If you click that, you could zoom in on your images and it'll give you a much closer look. And you can then turn this wheel to zoom out a little bit and then you can zoom in and just make sure you got your sharpness correct. So you use the magnifying glass up here for that and then this wheel to zoom in and out. And then you just hit menu to exit. That'll bring you back to your full scene. In addition, if you hit the display button, you can display different information on the files, just like you can in regular mode using the display button. So that's a cool feature, especially if you're looking for histogram information and things like that. If you hit the AEL button over here, you can actually zoom and look at all different ways, like by date and so forth. And if you zoom in, it'll bring it into a grid mode like this, and then it'll eventually bring you back to your single file. So the AEL is how you can zoom out if you want to see you know, in a, in a more broad view, how many photos you have. And then again, if you hit the AL button again, you can go by date, which is very helpful, especially if you're on vacation or something like that, you know, as an example. And that's basically how you use playback mode. That is pretty much it for this video. I really hope you guys got something out of it. Please let me know if you want a specific tutorial on anything on this camera while I have it. I should have it for another two weeks or so at the time of this recording. And I do plan on doing another video, like I said, on manual mode, shutter priority mode, aperture priority mode. So stay tuned for that. Pretty much covered all the basic stuff in here that I think you really need to know when you first get start going. The only other thing I didn't cover was picture effects. And those are kind of fun to play with. Um, you have to use JPEG mode for those. If you go into the menu, I skipped over that feature. Yeah, picture effects. See, it's right here. It's grayed out because I'm in raw quality. But if you, if you change your quality to JPEG, you can go in there. And there's all these different creative effects you can do. Black and white, soft focus, things like that. Illustration mode and stuff. A lot of fun to play with, but you have to shoot in JPEG mode for that. But it is still a lot of fun. So, like I was saying, that is pretty much it for this video. I know there's a lot of information here. There's so much stuff in the menu system to go over. I could literally spend hours going over all those options. So I'm just trying to get you going with this video from a beginner oriented perspective. And I really hope you can get out there and start taking some videos and some photos and you feel much more confident using your camera if you just got it. And uh, you know, you're a little overwhelmed by all the features and stuff. So make sure you uh, put your neck strap on or get a wrist strap or something because you do not want to drop this camera. And be sure to check out my e-mount lens guides if you're looking for different lenses and you don't know what to get. I have great lens guides with links to all my reviews and stuff like that to really help you get going if you, uh, you know, need help in that regard. But by all means, ask questions below the video as well, and I'll be more than happy to try and help you out as best I can. So be sure to give me a thumbs up if you like this video, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to see upcoming videos in the future. Also be sure to hit that notification bell and that will make sure that you get emailed when a new video comes out. Just subscribing won't send you an email. Um, based on my experience, you do have to hit that notification bell in order to get the email that a new video came out. So, all right guys, links below for all those tutorials that I mentioned and also links to different gear that uh, I recommend for Sony cameras such as memory cards, tripods, things like that. So be sure to check that out if you're in the market and I will catch up with you next time. All right, take care, have a great day. Bye.